the chief weapon, the chief weapon that God has given us in these days other than our faith in Him is a principle that many of us don't like to practice. It is the principle of, listen, submission. You say, now wait a minute. It would seem like if we're going to be overcomers, it ought to be the principle of rebellion. No. It's the principle of submission. And this principle is such that it will close the mouths of those who oppose us. Adrian Rogers was a motivator, an encourager, and a leader of the faith who presented a clear invitation to follow Jesus at every opportunity. He was also passionate about presenting scriptural application to everyday life circumstances. And you'll see that in today's message. Have your Bible ready and join us for this study from God's Word. And if you're encouraged by today's message, remember you can stream this message again and download outlines, notes, a transcript, and other resources to go along with this message, all at lwf.org. Now, let's join Adrian Rogers. Would you take God's Word and be finding 1 Peter chapter 2 as we continue our series on discovering kingdom authority. If there's ever a day and an age in which we need to discover and to deploy kingdom authority, this is the day and this is the age. Now, before I read the Scripture, and we're going to be reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Before I read the Scripture, let me just tell you something about the Christians to whom this Scripture was written. They were going through tough times. It was open season on Christians. They were being accused, and they were being slandered by the enemy. Let me tell you some of the things they accused them of. They accused them of incest, incest because they called their wives or their husbands brother or sister. They were accused of cannibalism because when they took the Lord's Supper, they said, we are partaking of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. They were accused of insurrection because they said, Caesar is not Lord, Jesus is Lord. And so they were hunted and hounded and killed. Do you know why they were? Because they were like the Lord Jesus. And the servant is not better than his master. Jesus said, if they've hated me, they will hate you. And Jesus was slandered. They called him a wine-bibber and a glutton. I'm going to tell you this, that anybody who lives for the Lord Jesus Christ in this day, in this age, or in that day, and that age, or any age, is going to find himself going against the tide. We're twice-born people in a world of once-born people, and what we practice and what we believe begins at a different source. It follows a different course. It arrives at a different conclusion. And we're going to be going against the tide. Now, the chief weapon, the chief weapon that God has given us in these days other than our faith in Him is a principle that many of us don't like to practice. It is the principle of, listen, submission. You say, now wait a minute. It would seem like if we're going to be overcomers, it ought to be the principle of rebellion. No. It's the principle of submission. And this principle is such that it will close the mouths of those who oppose us. Look in verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Having your conversation, that means your behavior, honest among the Gentiles, that's the pagans, Whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, and we're going to show you what those good works are in just a moment, which they shall behold 
glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, the day of visitation is not talking about when Jesus comes again. It literally means the day of inspection or the day of observation. And then notice what he says in verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Did you see that? Submit yourselves. Now, skip on down to verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters in all fear. Turn over to chapter 3 and verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. That's an interesting thing. He speaks of evildoers. And he says we're to do something that will cause them to recognize in us a quality that is absolutely astounding and amazing. And look down, if you will, in, in verse 15. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may silence the ignorance of foolish men. People who oppose God's people are ignorant and they're foolish. And how do you silence them? Submission. 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 And this word silence literally means in the Greek language to muzzle like you would muzzle a yapping dog. How are we going, how are we going to make a statement in this world? How are we going to exercise kingdom authority by submission? You say, now wait a minute, submission doesn't sound like authority. You see, that's the secret of the whole thing. Remember again that centurion who said to Jesus, Jesus, I know how you operate. I know why you have authority over this disease because I also am a man set under authority. And I say to this man, go, and he goes, and to this man, come, and he go, and he comes. And Jesus, all you need to do is to speak the word, and my servant will be healed, for I know how you work. And Jesus said, I've not seen faith like this in all the land of Israel. This man who was under the emperor was over his soldiers. You can never be over those things that God has put under you until you get under those things that God has put over you. Now, that's what we're talking about, this whole series, kingdom authority. Let me say it again. You will never be over those things that God has set under you until you remain under those things that God has set over you. Kingdom authority is not for rebels. And God cannot trust us and give us the release of the Spirit until we know the restraint of the Spirit. So he says here that we're to submit. We're to submit to civil magistrates. We're to submit to those who uh, work us on the job. We are to submit domestically in the home. This is what God says that we're to do. Now, let me mention several things about this principle this morning. And by the way, what we're talking about, because I failed to tell you when we began, we're talking about the problem of unworthy authorities. How do you submit to an ungodly government? Godless government. How do you submit to a bad boss? How do you submit to a mean mate? What if they ask us to do something wrong, ungodly? What do we do? How can we live this principle of submission in a wicked, lascivious age? Good question. All right, now let's look at it. Let's just take the Word of God and look at it. Look at the very principle of submission. Again, I remind you, verse 13 says, submit yourselves. Verse 18 says, servants, be subject. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Wives, be in subjection. What is submission? We're talking about the principle of it. What is submission? Submission is one equal, one equal, voluntarily placing himself under another equal, that God may therefore be glorified. Submission is simply getting under the authority that God has established, not for that authority's sake, but for God himself's sake who established the authority. Look in verse 13. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. When, when, when you submit yourself to some governmental authority, you're not doing it for his sake. 
You're doing it for Jesus' sake. And that makes a difference. You see, God has established authority everywhere. And God is behind all authority. <laughs> so when you're submitting, you're not submitting to some human being. You're submitting really ultimately to Almighty God. And when you do that, God begins to invest in you kingdom authority. Remember that when you have the spirit of rebellion, you're like Satan. He was the original rebel. When you submit to authority, you're like the Lord Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, being found in form as a servant. He humbled himself and became obedient. Now, Satan said, I will exalt myself. God says, you're going down. Jesus said, I humble myself. God said, I'll give you a name that is above every name. Now, Jesus has this incredible authority because of this principle. Remember what Samuel told Saul that rebellion is as witchcraft. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. When you have a rebellious spirit, you're practicing the same spirit that made the devil the devil to begin with, and that is witchcraft. Now, you want kingdom authority. I do too. I want to live victoriously. I want power over the world, the flesh, and the devil. But come up close and I will tell you something. Authority and submission are heads and tails of the same coin. Authority flows out of submission. That's a principle that we need to understand. And being submissive does not demean you it exalts you. It makes you like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is the principle. That is the principle of submission. Now, let's talk about uh, some places of submission. We've already mentioned them, uh, but Peter picks out uh, three very hard places. Number one, uh, he's talking about being submissive to a godless government. Now, you say, well, when Peter wrote this, he didn't know who was in the White House. <laughs> Let me tell you who was on the throne of Rome. His name was Nero. Well, first of all, let's read verse 13. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, we're free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Well, you say if they had a good king, I can understand that. Well, let me tell you who was the king. His name was Nero. Let me read what one man said about Nero. He was just three years old when his father died. It was little loss to the boy, for his father had been a killer, a bully, and a cheat. His mother took over the family trade and continued the boy's education. She murdered his stepfather with a dish of poisoned mushrooms. He was reared in squalor and proved a notable son to his parents. While still young, he committed his first murder, killing a teenage boy who stood in his way and watching him die with callous indifference. He married at 15, but soon had his wife killed. He married again and slew his second wife also. In order to marry a third time, he murdered the husband of the woman he wanted. His mother annoyed him, so he arranged her murder, first by guile, but when that was unsuccessful, he murdered her without pretense. He was an ugly man with a bull neck, a beetle brow, a flat nose, and a tough mouth. He had a pot belly, spindly legs, bad skin, and an offensive odor. At the age of 31, he was sentenced to death by flogging. He fled to a dingy basement in the house of a slave, cut his own throat. He survived that, and he gave the infant church its first taste of things to come. His name was Nero. He was the first of the persecuting Caesars of Rome. That's the one. That's the one 
that Peter says, honor the king. Honor the king. That's incredible. Well, why is this? Because verse 14 teaches us that authority is necessary. C.S. Lewis said this about democracy. He said that he was in favor of democracy, not because everybody is equally intelligent or equally qualified to have an equal say, but because everybody is equally sinful and we all need to keep an eye on each other. That's why he said we're in favor of democracy. Well, whatever it is, whether it is a, a king or democracy, an oligarchy, whatever it is, there can be no civilization without government. We are to have a submissive spirit to the government. And an attitude of rebellion is as bad as the rebellion itself. Look again in verses 16 and 17. We're free and not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Now look at this. Honor all men in our social life. We'd honor all men, every man, red, yellow, black, white, young, old, Christian, pagan, every man in the similitude and image of God is to be honored. The word honor is the word, is a Greek word, is the word from which we get our word preciousness. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious. In his sight, all men are intrinsically precious to God. Do you believe that? I hope you do. I don't care who he is. It matters not what he has done. The Bible says honor all men in our social life. And then in our church life, in verse 17, it says love the brotherhood. Now, we are special. There is a special love that we're to have for our brothers and sisters in Christ. I love all people, but my wife is my beloved. She is above all other women in my life. And in the Christian world, our brothers and sisters in Christ are special. Uh, we are to love one another with a very special love. And so the Bible says we are to honor the brotherhood. Then in our spiritual life, he says, fear God. Verse 17, if there's one thing that we need in America today, it is to bring back the fear of Almighty God, for the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and America has lost that. But then he says, finally, in our political life, not only in our social life, our church life, our spiritual life, but in our political life, we are to honor the king. Whether that uh, government is led by king or president, the principle is the same. Put in your margin 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 1 through 3, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And so uh, we are to submit to godless government. You say, well, I've got some big questions about that. Maybe I'll answer them before we have the, the message ends if you listen in a hurry. Now, second thing, not only should we sub submit to a godless government, but to a bad boss. Look, if you will, in verses 18 and 19. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now, the word servant here literally means household slave. is not talking about a domestic servant like we have today who is paid, but it's talking about a person who was a slave. And these slaves were not inferior people. In that day, a man would have a doctor slave to take care of him. He would have a, a teacher slave to educate his children. But Aristotle, uh, his philosophy had come to full flower, and he said, Aristotle said, master and slave have nothing in common. A slave is a living tool, just as a tool is an inanimate slave. Slaves were not treated as persons. They were treated as things. And yet, Peter says, slaves, be in submission to your master as unto the Lord. You say, well, now, wait a minute. Shouldn't we be against slavery? 
with all of our heart. And what Peter taught here brought slavery crashing down. He was speaking of reality. They found themselves in a situation over which they had no control. But he said, now guard your spirit. Have a submissive spirit. Maybe some of you today are not a slave in that sense, but you work for what you call a slave driver. Well, let me tell you something. There is no better place for you to demonstrate the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ if you have an unfair or an ungodly boss. Any pagan can gripe and rebel when things are wrong. But notice what he says in verse 19, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now he mentions a third case of an unworthy authority. How do you re react toward unworthy authorities? Godless government, bad bosses, mean mates. Look in chapter 3, verse 1, Likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, this is not talking about a Christian husband. It's talking about an ungodly husband who will not obey the word of God. They may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That is, while they behold your chaste or pure behavior, joined or coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of the plaiting of the hair, the wearing of gold, or the putting on of apparel. Now, lady, he's not saying it's wrong to fix your hair or to wear gold. If it is, it's wrong for you to wear clothes. He's not saying that. He's saying that is not your adornment. But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. This is so contrary to the wisdom of this world that a wife is to be submissive even to an ungodly husband. But the Bible teaches that a home cannot function without the head. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. A Christ, the son, God the Son, and God the Father co-equal, co-eternal? Of course. Is a man and a woman, are they co-equal? Of course. She is not inferior to him. Submission is one equal, placing himself or herself voluntarily under another equal, that God thereby may be glorified. Galatians 3, verse 28 says, There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there bond nor free, neither is there male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. That is settled. But God teaches authority. And what should a, what should a wife do if she has an ungodly, unworthy husband? She's not to lecture him, according to the Scripture. She's not to leave him. She is to love him. Mrs. Billy Graham said, it is your job to love your husband. It is God's job to make him good. Now, let's move on quickly. We've talked about the principle of submission. That is that we will never be over those things that God has put under us until we get under those things that God has put over us. We've talked about the places of submission. And Peter mentions three of them, the government, the job, and the home. Now let's talk about the problems of submission because there's some real problems. Suppose you work for a man and he asks you to do something dishonest. He asks you to cook the books, to juggle things, to steal for him, and you try to be in submission. Suppose uh, you are in a government and the government enforces upon you an unjust law and asks you to do something that is contrary to the will of of God. Suppose the government were to tell me that I could not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me say this, and I want you to listen carefully. Submission is not always the same as obedience. Submission is not always the same as obedience. Your ultimate loyalty belongs to God. Your ultimate loyalty belongs to God. You're to render unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and unto God the things that are, belong to God, but never give to Caesar the things that belong to God. Never give to Caesar the things that belong to God. Let me give you an illustration of that. The apostles were preaching the Lord Jesus Christ and the high muckety-mucks, the magistrates said, Be quiet. You're upsetting the status quo. Don't preach anymore. Put this verse down in your margin, Acts chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. 
They caught them there and they told them not to preach. And I'm beginning in verse 28 saying, Did not we strictly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Do you have that? We ought to obey God rather than men. Now, for their disobedience, they were thrown into jail. They submitted as far as they could. And as far as I can tell, they did not resist when they were thrown into jail. But they did not stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. All human authority is limited. There are some commands that are qualified, and there are some commands that are not qualified. Let me give you an example of a, of a command that is qualified. Now, the Bible says we're to live in peace. But Romans 12, verse 18 says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, the reason that sometimes it's impossible is we can't control other men. And so we, we, must, we must be submissive if possible, as much as lieth in us, lies in us. But if there comes a time when uh, somebody commands us to do something that is antithetical to the Word of God, the truth of God, then we obey God rather than men. You see, the greatest principle is that of obedience to God, and it always takes priority over the lesser principle of obedience to men. You can find examples of this all in the Bible. For example, I just, uh, I just mentioned where, where uh, Pharaoh in, in Moses' day said all the little boy babies are to be killed. Well, the godly midwives would not kill the little boy babies. That was disobedience. And if you work in a hospital and they're performing an abortion, you just say, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I am not going to participate in the killing of a baby. Fire me if you will. If it ever gets to be a law, arrest me if you will. But I am not going to do it. If, you, if you're a, a medical doctor here in a hospital, just say, no, count me out. I am not going to do it. Now, it was the law in, in Herod's day, but they did not do it. They told Daniel, Daniel, you cannot pray. But Daniel prayed. Daniel prayed. Now, we must have a spirit of submission. But my friend, let me tell you this. Submission is not always obedience. There was a pastor in Hitler's day, Martin Niemöller. And Ni Martin Niemöller saw what Hitler was doing and, and uh, they tried to shut him up and they said, you can't preach this anymore. Hitler doesn't like it. And Martin Niemöller said, God is my Fuhrer. God is my Fuhrer. They put him in a concentration camp. All human authority is limited. We render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. We render unto God the things that are God's, but we will not render unto Caesar the things that are God's. Now, let me say something about the political situation that we're in right now. We as believers in Christ need not identify the church with any political party, but always with the kingdom of God. We need to be able to tell both parties to repent and get right with God. The church is not the servant of the state. The church is not the master of the state. The church is the conscience of the state. We will be civil, but we will not be silent. Nathan warned David. Elijah preached to Ahab. Daniel remonstrated with Nebuchadnezzar. Eliezer looked Jehoshaphat in the face and told him he was wrong. Moses was a prophet of God to Pharaoh. And as long as they're killing babies, there's one preacher who will not be silent standing right here today. As long as we have a government that's trying to normalize sodomy, I cannot be quiet. As long as a free-born American is told he cannot pray vocally anywhere, anytime, we cannot be silent. Nothing. Well, yes, give God a hand. 
Nothing is politically right that is morally wrong. But if you think that an election is going to help us, let me tell you something, folks. Government cannot make us good. Only God can make us good. Government is here to restrain evil. And God's plan is a free church and a free state. And when the government does what it alone can do, that is restrain evil, the church is free to do what she alone can do, and that is to preach the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. There are problems with submission, but we need to understand that we must obey God. What if a wife, what if a wife has a husband who is physically abusing her? And the Bible says, be in submission. The Bible says also, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. If I had a daughter who was physically, being physically abused and battered, I'd get her out of that situation. I, 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 would, I wouldn't say, well, now the Bible says submit. Yes, she is to have a submissive spirit. But there is a time, there is a time when there is a higher law that takes precedent. And so remember that our ultimate allegiance is to Almighty God. A man was praying for a politician. A politician said, oh, I'm so glad you've learned to pray for those who are in authority. He said, that wasn't the verse I had in mind. I was praying for those who persecute you. <laughs> now, folks, listen. We are to have a submissive spirit. Now, let me just, I must wrap this up. I've talked to you about the principle. I have talked to you about the places. I've talked to you about the problems. Let me talk to you about the price of submission. You think this is easy? This is the hardest thing we're asked to do. Look, if you will, in verse 19 and through 21. He says, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye you take it patiently? But if ye, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. That is, he appealed to the supreme court of the universe, and the word means he just handed himself over to God. He had undeserved suffering, unretaliating suffering, unfrustrated suffering, because he was counting on God to even the score. Well, you say, Pastor, that, that doesn't sound fair. Well, let's look at verse 40, uh, 24. Speaking of Jesus, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. That is, he, bear our, he bore our sins. He took our sins. Think of a doctor who makes himself sick in order to make the patient well and then turns around and pays the hospital bill. That's King Jesus. Now, that wasn't fair, but thank God he did it. Amen? And he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. And because of that, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. And I'm telling you, folks, God will do the same thing for us when we begin to obey Almighty God. You see, it was the spirit of these early Christians that brought the Roman Empire crashing down. Because God gave them kingdom authority. And they turned that world upside down because they learned the strength of submission. They did not give in to evil. They overcame evil. Submission does not embolden tyranny. It destroys it. And they were just honeycombing that entire Roman Empire, that mountain of evil, with gospel dynamite. And it brought the whole thing crashing down. God gives authority to those who understand submission. We will never be over those things that God has put under us until we get under those things that God has put over us the Lordship of Christ, the Word of God, those institutions that God has put in place. They were killing the Christians up in the Colosseum. It would seat 50,000 people. I've stood there many times. 
underneath the ground in the catacombs <laughs> were the Christians worshiping God and praying to God. Up here, Caesar was Lord. Down here, Jesus was Lord. But Caesar's gone, friend, and Jesus is still Lord. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. We have victory in Jesus. Let me have another moment of your time. We often hear the word saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What does it mean to be saved? Well, number one, it means that every sin is forgiven and buried in the grave of God's forgetfulness. Number two, it means that God, through the Holy Spirit, comes to live in us. That's not an emotional feeling. It is an awareness that God is there. Number three, it means that when we die, or when Jesus comes again, He takes us home to heaven to be with Him. Now, how are we saved? The Bible says clearly, plainly, sweetly, sublimely, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Now, that word believe goes beyond intellectual belief. It's a Bible word that means trust. Trust Him. Do it now. Say, Lord Jesus, like a child, I trust you to save me. Pray it and mean it. And if you do, write to us and let us know, and we'll send you some literature to help you get started in your Christian life. We hope that today's message has been an encouragement to you as we've studied God's Word together. For more resources from Adrian Rogers, including copies or downloads of this message, as well as Pastor Rogers' outline, notes, or a complete transcript of this message, please visit our website, lwf.org. You can also check out the complete series available through our online store. At lwf.org, you can also sign up to receive our new daily heartbeat email. Each heartbeat contains a daily scripture and devotional thought from Adrian Rogers an inspirational 90-second treasure from the Word, as well as a link to our daily radio program, all in one place, delivered directly to your computer or mobile device each morning. And if you're looking for some inspiration or encouragement to get you through the week, check us out on social media at LWF Ministries. Join us next time as we continue this powerful series of messages from Adrian Rogers. Thanks for joining us for today's program. We'll see you next time. How can you know the Bible is the Word of God? How can you keep your spiritual fire burning in the mundane times? Prepare to see your Bible in a whole new light and experience the life-changing power of Scripture through five dynamic lessons from Adrian Rogers. To say thank you for your gift this month, we want to send you our God's Word booklet collection featuring five insightful booklets covering a range of practical topics, such as how to make your Bible come alive, how to know the Bible is the Word of God, how to keep your spiritual fire burning, how to have a meaningful quiet time, and how to put power in your prayer. Request the God's Word booklet collection when you call with your gift, 1-800-647-9400, or you can give online at lwf.org. This bundle is a perfect tool for those who want to nurture their growing faith. Call or write today.